What's going on, my Dominators? Rico Garcia here, and today's episode, we're going to be joined by really amazing guests. This is a grassroots story from, you know, the Windy City in Chicago. Uh, we're going to be talking to one of our very own restoration success stories. And I'm really excited to go ahead and uh, share this particular episode with you. Uh, because I think that, you know, these are the kind of stories that really motivate a lot of the younger individuals that are coming into the business to let them know that absolutely anything is possible. Uh, but before we start talking about that, the first thing that I want to go ahead and do is thank our sponsors, starting with CNR Magazine, uh, which again, you should already be a subscriber because it's absolutely free and you get to keep your finger on the pulse of the market. But if you haven't done so yet, just head on over to cnrmagazine.com, upper right-hand corner of the screen. You're going to see a big red button. Just go ahead and smash that, fill in your details, and boom, you're going to be a subscriber. You would be one of the insiders. So make sure that you do that now. So on this episode today, we are joined by Ramiro Martinez. He's located out of the uh, Illinois area with First Choice Solutions uh, Restoration Company. And it's a really amazing story. Uh, basically gives us a 30,000 foot view of what it's like to enter the restoration arena with little to no experience and all of the bumps and bruises uh, that he got along the way to building a successful company now that is still growing year after year. And also a really important thing that we spoke about towards the end of the interview was this amazing bolt-on that he did with his restoration uh, business that is generating a tremendous amount of revenue right out of the gate, month one, that if you are in water mitigation, mold remediation, things of that nature, you want to get more water jobs, uh, and you want to increase your overall profitability, you're not going to want to miss this part towards the end of the interview. So make sure that you stick around to the very end, uh, because it's going to be really exciting uh, to hear a case study that may potentially benefit you in your business. So this is a really cool uh, episode. I love uh, getting together with other entrepreneurs that are in the business, that are still in the trenches, that aren't so far removed from the realities of running a business. He's currently sub $10 million in annual revenue. So this, these are the type of stories that for a lot of us, right? I would say the, the grand majority of the restoration business owners out there, especially the newer ones that are entering the business right now, you're just trying to figure out like how to get to your first, you know, first million, your two, three, four, five million dollars in revenue. And these are the kind of stories that I believe are really inspirational because we all want to hear about these great, you know, hundred million dollar a year revenue companies, right? That that's great. But sometimes that's so far removed from what our present reality is that we kind of have a hard time wrapping our head around it. So um, I really enjoyed this interview uh, with Ramiro. I think that there was a lot of big takeaways. Uh, we talk a lot about company culture and how to build and more importantly, perspective and how perspective changes over time. I hope that you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Uh, and without further ado, let's jump right into the show. Welcome to the Restoration Domination Podcast, where you learn actionable advice that moves the needle and helps service-based businesses dominate. Here's your host, Rico Garcia, Jr. All right, all right, all right. What is going on? Welcome. We are currently live with the one and only Ramiro. Ramiro, welcome to the show. Are you ready to help us dominate? Yes, sir. All right, let's do it. Do me a favor, man. Fill in some of the gaps on the intro. Uh, for those that may not be familiar with the name, uh, may not be familiar with the company, go ahead and let everybody know exactly who you are and what you're doing in the industry. Yeah, uh, my name is Ramiro Martinez. I'm owner of First Choice Solutions out of the Chicagoland area, full service restoration company. I've been in the industry for about 15 years now. Prior to that, I was an insurance agent and uh, did that for about 10 years. And currently also now got into plumbing. So we own a, a plumbing company as well, which we're, we're very excited about. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, the plumbing side of the business, which is actually very exciting. We've had a few conversations about that as well. We've actually mentioned it on the podcast prior to uh, you being on the show. So I think this is going to be a good little segue for a lot of other restorers out there as well. So make sure you stick around because I think that you're going to get some fire value from this, Dominators. So 15 years in the business, like that's nothing to shake a stick at, right? I mean, that's, that's definitely some time you, you've seen some changes in the arena. Take us like back to the beginning, take us back to the beginning. I mean, what got you into the restoration arena to begin with? So being an insurance agent, I I had a client that owned a restoration company and he and his brothers uh, had the company for about 10 years at the time. And one of his brothers decided to leave them and they, the, the other three brothers had no idea what restoration was and they all worked in different types of business. And so they were my client and he came to me one day and said, Hey, would you like to work for me? And uh, I, I was like, no, I'm, I'm good where I'm at. And I tried to shove him off, a, you know, a few times and <laughs> I couldn't get the guy off of me. And he one day just came to me and says, listen, I really need you. And I said, I, well, I know nothing about the restoration industry, right? And so um, there's nothing that I could possibly help you with. He says, no, no, no. I'm sure you could help us. And long story short, I threw a high number at him, hoping he'd said no. <laughs> he said yes. So uh, after... Isn't that the worst, by the yeah. way, when, when you throw a number out and immediately they say yes, and you're like, oh, I should have gone higher. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, <laughs> if it was going to be that way, I should have gone higher, right? Right, right. But... What happened is uh, there was a four month transition. It wasn't an easy transition, but I had to learn the restoration industry by running a company. I wasn't, I didn't come in as a technician. That that's not how I came in. I had no idea what the restoration industry looked like, and took me by surprise. I, I had to, I'm self taught exactimate estimate writer, but that was, you know, I had to learn it. I committed to this guy, and I said, yes, I'll help you. And so that's how I started. And I worked with him for about a year uh, until there was a a lot of conflicting issues uh, with my character and my ethics. And so I I ended up just saying, you know what, I'm going to leave. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. So I I ended up leaving. I remember talking to my wife at that time and I said, honey, I, I just, I left my job. And she says, really? What what are you going to do now? I said, I, I don't know. And, you know, I, maybe I go back to insurance, right? And I said, but I could also stick with the restoration since I've learned it. And she says, well, just follow your heart. I said, thank you, honey. That, that's great help. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> right. At that moment, that's not what you're looking for, right? You're looking for right. a more direct answer. Hey, do the Yeah. And um, yeah. so what ended up happening is I stuck with restoration. Mm. Uh, I went on my own at the time. Um, ran my first company for about five years and then ended up closing shop and I, I just sold all my assets. I closed my shop. I, I was a little, I was discouraged and disappointed by the industry. And I just decided to to walk away from it. And I did for about a year and a half. Then I came back and I, and I went to work for someone else and eventually went back on my own again. How did that experience go from closing your shop and then going to work for somebody else. Was that a good experience or did, did you fill in some of the gaps maybe on your knowledge base or how did that work? How did that feel? Well, it, it definitely helped me to, to see it from a, a different perspective. Because remember, uh, I came into the restoration industry knowing nothing about it. The, the mm-hmm. first time I'm in a restoration company, I'm running it and I have no idea what I'm doing. And then the second time I'm in a restoration company, I'm running it. <laughs> And I still have no idea what I'm doing, right? I was never a business owner before. I was a salesperson. I've been I've right. been in sales my whole life. And so that was that was very hard for me. But when I went to work for somebody else doing this, it was also very easy for me because I had already six years or seven years of experience by then doing everything, right? You name it, project management, sales, marketing, you um being out there and grinding uh, in the field with uh, whether it was mitigation or, or mold remediation, whatever it was, I was out there physically doing the work. And so when I come work for right. somebody else, I'm my mentality is still, I know how to do it all. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to get my hands dirty. I don't care. And so 
I found myself doing a lot of things, but then I also learned a lot. I learned, you know, what a business should look like. I, I learned, you know, how to structure a business. Uh, I learned uh, how to build, uh, you know, some quality relationships and and how to build a reputation. And so that that part of it, I, I had not had the opportunity to understand yet, right? And so the first time I ran business, it was great because I, I was bringing in business in the door. I think our first company on my own, I had one project manager. I think I had four techs and we, we were able to do a million dollars, which wasn't bad for a person that, that had no experience in this industry. That's not a bad gig. Mm -hmm. we, we did pretty well, <clears throat> but, but I, I had no idea there was more out there that I could be doing more. I was comfortable. I, it, it was good. It was stressful many times, but at the same time, I, it, it was a comfortable living. Right. And so I had no idea there was a lot more out there. And then. Right. And that just goes to show, right. Sometimes taking a step back isn't necessarily a bad thing. Like sometimes taking a step back is actually the catalyst that's going to get you to where you want to be. And you just really don't know what you don't know. If you've never been exposed to, let's say company culture and how to build a good company culture, well, then how are you expected to, to, to accomplish that in your own company, right? I mean, right. you know, or how to properly position yourself or how to properly build relationships. It's not to say that you can't do those things. You can, but what if you're just going about it the wrong way? And sometimes, you know, and this is where I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a big disconnect in our, in our industry is just having the ability to go and speak to other people, ask questions, find out how it is that they're doing, right? Or, you know, Trey, if you have the ability to, peek behind the curtains, then go ahead and peek behind the curtains. But it's just one of those things where a lot of people just refuse to be humble or to take a step back or to go work for another company to try to figure out like where it is that they, they're, they're missing, where they have some gaps or much less, they just don't want to get the mentorship. They don't want to get the help that they need, but then great. So now that you got some, some gaps filled in, right? You got to firsthand exposure. You knew what it was like to run your business. You did okay. And then what made you leave from there and just open up your own shop? So I actually was, was let go. Um, so at, at the time, you know, things were, were being moved around where I was at. And, and so I was one of the people that would let go during that time. And so I then decided I, I'm not going to start. I, I, I wasn't going to start on my own. The, the thing was circumstances made me start on my own again, but I, I was very cautious this time. I actually just became a general, well, before I became a general contractor, I was just consulting for other companies helping them bring, bring in sales, helping them, you know, kind of structure their business and things like that. So I did incorporate, but I wasn't really doing any work myself. I was helping other companies do it. And I was doing traveling, hurricane, you know, catastrophe runs and stuff like that. But I was doing it with other companies and I was helping them and, and just helping them grow their own company until one day my, my two oldest children they sit down with me and they said, dad, we would like you to start the company again, but like full service. And I'm like, no, there's no way. I don't want to get into that. I don't want the headaches. I, I don't want the stress. And they said, dad, you're not going to have them this time because we're old enough now. Remind you the first time that I ran my own business, I did it on my own. My kids were still in high school. And so I wasn't getting much help from them at all. Mm -hmm. This time they're, they're out of college. They're, they're ready. They're, you know, they've got energy. I don't have it at the time. I didn't have it because I wasn't really thinking of starting my business. Right. And so I, I said no so many times that they had no other right. option, but to go to mom. <laughs> and so they get mom involved and they say, mom, we've been talking to dad. Dad doesn't want to start the business, but we really <laughs> want him to start the business. We want to build something with it. And mom just looked at me and said, don't do it for you. Do it right. for them. And that's it. That's <laughs> that was it. it. You're like, Thanks. That was it. Appreciate it. What? Yeah. What can you say yeah, after that? Done. Right. right. Uh, <laughs> and and that's how I got into this. It, it, owning my my own business again. It wasn't it wasn't something that I planned out or or I had a a great plan to execute and I had an end goal in mind. I, I didn't have any of that. It's, you know, we talked about it before. This is survival. This is doing something that, that you want to, you know, if you want to keep the family happy, you want to 
keep the wife happy. You want the kids to feel like they're doing something in their life. And so this wasn't about me. This was more about my family. And that's how we got started. Yeah, we were talking off camera about uh, paradigm shifts, right? About how how differently you see a situation when you first start a business as opposed to once you're already in the business for a while and you've gotten some success, right? Like there's these are two different versions of the same of the same person, right? Like how someone enters the business and then how someone evolves as they're in the business, right? Can you talk to us a little bit about that and how that shift happened for you? Sure. Um, so the, the, I guess the, the first thing is uh, it all it all depends on how you measure success, right? What is success to you? And so success to me back then was making money, being able to have a comfortable living, uh, being able to provide for your family, being able to do nice things, uh, go go out to nice places. And that's how I was measuring success. And, and my my goal was to to bring in revenue and, and just, hey, show the world that I can make money. And that, that, that was, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely <laughs> is not because I, I still have, I could say that I still have that mentality, but now my goals have changed though. Right. I still want to make the money. I still want to be successful, but my goals have changed. There's a reason behind it now. And that's where that shift happened. Right. I want to say about a year and a half into our business. So we started the business January of 2018, just three of us. That was it. My my daughter, my son, and myself. And we were it. I mean, we were out in the field. We were doing the work. We were we started with a personal vehicle. This this wasn't pretty. <laughs> I didn't start I didn't right. start with money. I didn't, you know, we had our personal van minivan that we were out there carrying DHUs and air movers in, right? And so trash bags were going in the minivan and then we we're going to, to the, to the yard to, to dump it. Right. So yeah, this is how we started and we were doing it all in a uh, year and a half into it. We are, you know, we finished our first year at, I think $900,000 in sales in our first year and <clears throat> funny. mid, yeah. mid second year, we now have, I think at that time we, we were up to nine employees and we're rocking and and then i don't know something happened to me where i said okay why am i really doing this because you you mentioned something earlier right what did i learn by working for someone else and i remembered how i felt while working for someone else the many times and not just myself my colleagues Everyone that I that I worked with, everyone that that was involved in any, any of the, the things that I was doing while at that place, right? And I would remember the conversations that people would have. I remember the feelings. I would remember what everybody was going through. And so that came to me, and and I said, okay, I'm doing this for the wrong reason. There's there's something better that I can do. Yes, let's make money, but let's also make an impact. And so we all, most restorers say that we're here to help our customers, right? Um, in, in a moment of chaos in their life, in a moment of catastrophe, you're there for them, right? But I, I found out something greater than that. I need employees that see that. How do I get right. my employees to buy into that vision, right? And I can't buy it. There's no way you can't buy that. And so I had to figure out what cult company culture had to look like. And I started investing into my employees. I started making sure that my employees were doing good, that my employees felt like they were doing good for someone else. And we, we just had this shift and, and we start working on company culture. That That's the very first thing that we, as now a legitimate business uh, being successful, this is what hit us hard and we say okay we have to start thinking about employees if we want people to stay with us for a long time if we want them to provide quality service to our clients we need to make sure that they have a quality life at work and outside of work so that's what we started working on the quality and the company <clears throat> culture and all of that so just just for context right um right now you've been in business since 2018 
And let's, if you don't mind, can you share like top line revenue at this point, just so that we can kind of get a spectrum of how much you've grown in that time? Yeah, we did uh, $3 million last year. Um, oh. And this year we were going to surpass that uh, by far. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we are now up to, well, with first choice, we're up to 24 employees, 25, I believe. We, we're, we, we keep hiring. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So I think we're up to 25 employees right now. And uh, our plumbing company currently has five employees now. So altogether, we're 30, 30 employees. Right, right. And that's definitely, you know, some amazing growth, right? And providing that like company culture has been, a bit, I'm assuming is a huge part of, of that growth, right? So what, what in your opinion was the, some of the biggest shifts within company culture? And, a lot, and this is like a, a hot topic right now. Everybody's talking about, you know, how can we keep employees? How can we hire employees? How can we, you know, make everybody feel all warm and fuzzy? Did you find the secret sauce or what was the secret sauce for you in your company? <clears throat> well, you know, one of the things is you want to pay people well, right? If if they deserve it and they earn it, they should be paid. Mm -hmm. Two is we treat them well. I, I've never yelled at an employee before. We don't go around cussing at anybody. We don't go around telling people you're worthless. Matter of fact, if somebody has an issue, I, I walk up to them, I bring them in my office, I sit down with them, I talk to them, I try to find out what's going on with them. Because sometimes it's not work related, it's something personal happening, but they don't realize that they're bringing it to work. And so I try to help them figure that out. And so where we can have a moment where they they can work on not bringing that to work and understand that it's important that we keep a positive environment, not just not, not just because the owner is asking for it, but because it, overall it, it's going to it's going to make everyone's job a lot easier. And we're going to be able to walk into someone's home or business and we're able we're going to be able to relate that over to them like positive, the positive environment. So when customers see us, they, they love it because they see that we're you know, we're always happy. We're we're engaged, we're, we're detailed, we're, you know, and that, that happens because of the environment. If, you know, one of the things that I've heard many times from my employees is they've never been at a place where they felt that good walking in in the morning, because most of the time they were walking into their job and they were bitter about it. Like, oh my God, here we go again. Oh my God, I wonder what they're going to come up with today. And with us, we, the feedback we get is, Oh my God, I'm excited to go into work. I can't wait to be there. I can't wait to, to, to work with my colleagues. And I'm not saying this is paradise and I'm not saying this is perfect by any means. We still have rubs, you know, things could get heated, but we're, we're very professional in a way that we handle things. And if we, if something starts to get too heated, we, we all walk away and then we reconvene and, and address the issue and figure out, okay, what went wrong here? Let's not point fingers. What went wrong? What can we do to fix this and prevent it from happening ever again? Right. And that's like tackling the the actual issue as opposed to the people, right? Correct. And something that a lot of business owners forget, and because we're so in the mix that for especially the 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 solopreneur, the entrepreneur, the owner operator who's starting to you know to bring employees in uh, for some additional help, that to us is our baby. Our business is our baby. It is essentially an extension of our family. However, the employees that we have are spending more time within our business than they are with their own families. And I think that sometimes that's a disconnect for some owners and for some entrepreneurs. And, you know, they, you forget that, hey, they have their own personal lives. They have their own things that they're dealing with. They've got, you know, their own goals and ambitions. And, you know, every once in a while, you got to have to take a step back and say, hey, look, you know, maybe it's not something work related, it's personal related. And as a good mentor, as a good business owner, someone who cares about, where they're going in life. You kind of have to, you know, kind of bring them into your office and take them under your wing and say, Hey, like what's going on? What's, you know, what's happening personally? What is it that we could do to help you? And by the way, let's find a way to where we can separate the personal from the business and create this positive work environment here. Because 
you have somebody who's upset bringing, you know, coming into work, odds are is in when they're hauling dehues and air movers into somebody's house, they're probably going to look upset <laughs> when they're when they're bringing in that equipment, right? So being able to identify that and have that degree of sensitivity is so is so important. Uh, one of the things that I, I constantly am asking, you know, m- my guest is the the three questions that you wish more business owners asked going into business. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think the top three questions are that more business owners should be asking themselves uh, when it comes down to business? So it's reputation. Um, yeah, reputation, uh, uh, how to build relationships that matter yeah. and why the financial health of any business is important. All right, good. So let's cue the uh, three questions. So three questions that you wish that more business owners asked if they wanted to be successful in business what would you say those are? So I would say that uh, the first one would be is, uh, how do I build a good reputation? How do I build a good brand? Second one would be, how do I build relationships that matter? Um, and then my third would be, um, why is it so important that a business has a good financial health? So let's let's unpack those a little bit, right? How do, how do you create a good reputation or great reputation right because we don't we, we live in a place now where where good just isn't good enough like you just got to be great you got to go above and beyond right like everybody kind of expects that so how do you build a great reputation what are some of the things that we need to keep in mind as a business owner uh, as an entity in order to portray that to the general public if if this is what i this is who i am right i i first analyzed myself and i said okay ramiro who are you and and I, re, I you know I was able to dig deep into myself and find out the real reasons why um, I'm doing this and and what I'm what's the outcome what am I looking for and and I realized that you know everybody talks about honesty everybody talks about transparency every everybody talks about loyalty but I ask myself is that really who I am is that you know Am, am I serious enough to commit to that and and be that person? Because unless right. unless unless you commit to it, there's no way you're you're going to be able to portray that. There's no way you're going to be able right. to build off of that. And so, and every every type of building that you're building, excuse the redundancy there, but um, <laughs> you have to have a solid foundation, and that's where it starts. You have to have a solid foundation. After that, you start building on top of that foundation um, and you look for ways to build on that foundation. Um, you have to have a plan. You have to you, you have to have an, you know, an engineer that, that puts it together that that says, if you do it this way, this is what's going to happen. It can shift this way. Or, so you want you want to make sure that someone is planning it accurately. Right. Whether it's the business owner or whether you have someone within your organization that you believe has that type of talent to be able to design it for you or you find a third party third party to design it for you it, you know we we hired consultants since our first year in business the second month in business we hired a consultant because we we had a plan we had a goal and we we needed that consultant to get us there and so that's how we were able to finish off the year at nine hundred thousand dollars in sales because we we had somebody help us design it. I can't say I knew how to do it. Uh, that's the other thing, right? I, I, I never try to be the smartest man in the, in the room. When, I, when right. I'm the smartest man in the room, then I become dumb. Right. Yeah, that's a problem. If you're always the smartest guy in the room or the smartest person in the room, like then then you're doing something wrong. You need to you need to expand your circles. And something that I think is really important is consulting that you mentioned in your very first year of business. There's a lot of business owners who are just like, hey, I just want to figure this out myself. And I get that, right? There's that's great. That's part of that entrepreneurial spirit. But at the same time, it's about working smarter, not harder. It's something that we hear all the time. If there's an answer available and it's not going to cost you months or years of your time and all it's going to cost you is 
dollars, which is a tool, right? Because that's really what, my, like, if I gave anybody a million dollars right now, and I just put it in the middle of the living room and just said, you can never touch it. Here's a million dollars, but you can never touch it. Like, you'd be like, well, that's worthless. I can't do anything with that million dollars, right? So it's not, it's not about the money. It's about what you can do with the money. So if you're out there, you're busting your butt, you're working as hard as you possibly can, you're doing that so that you can give yourself more tools in your toolbox, i.e. money. Now you go ahead and give that to a consultant, to a mentor, to this, to that, who can shortcut like that path to success, whatever that may be for you. Well, then that's, that's a smart play. Like you just exchanged something that you can go ahead and regenerate with just more deals in, in exchange for six months or a year or two years of your life, of your business life to get you to where you want to be. So the fact that you guys like went out in the very first year, you identified that you had a need and that you went out to do that, obviously that's paying off dividends at this point. Oh, absolutely. And so what what we did is we looked at it because, you know, obviously second month into business and the question was asked. The question was asked and, and it was, hey, do we even have money? to? Can we afford to pay for this consultant? It was an expensive consultant, right? And my question back to my folks was, can we afford not to hire this consultant? Right. I looked at it as an investment and I was going to get a return on my investment and I was going to make sure I got a return on my investment. So I was willing to invest. And that's what I, I always share with other business owners is don't be afraid to invest in your business, but make sure before you invest, you have a plan and you have a goal in mind because otherwise that investment's not going to do anything for you. It's great throwing money at things when you have a plan and a goal. But if you don't have a plan to follow and you don't have a goal in mind, don't throw money that way, right? And so uh, there's right. been many times where uh, I've invested in different things in business and a lot of them work and some have not. But I was able to determine which ones work and which ones don't. And, and that's what you do on a daily basis. You, you just, you keep trying to see what works. You keep those things at work and the things that don't work you throw out and, and then you, you try to find something else that will work. And that's what we've done. So build, you know, building reputation, we were talking about, we, we, we made sure that we were building a solid foundation to be able to build off of that and build a great reputation. Currently, uh, you know, four years in business now, and we have great reputation in, in our market, in our industry. And, it's just not me. It's not, it's not Ramiro is known, you know, for, for having a great reputation. It's, it's first choice. It's, it's everyone here. It's individuals. And you, you, you look at our Google reviews, my guys are most of the time being mentioned in those reviews. It's not a generic Google review. It's people going out of the way to say, Hey, can you give me the names of all the team? Everyone that was at my home, because I want to mention you guys, because you guys did such an awesome job. And so we have people that, that are sending us emails all the time and saying, oh, my God, you know, I'm sure your place is a great place to work for because your employees, they execute so greatly, very knowledgeable that they're, you know, they're excited about doing the work. They were they were willing to walk us through everything, hold our hand. And so how we did that was by having a foundation and making sure that we knew who we were first and make, yeah because I, I mean and we we have to we have to be faced with reality right you know um every day in every industry you're going to have people that are doing it for the wrong reason um not just in the restoration industry any industry people do it for the wrong reason but those that do it for the right reason they just need that little bit of guidance hey build a foundation then build off of that Right. And, you know, from one of the worst things that can happen for those types of business, business owners, the ones that are, in fact, doing it for the right reasons is to see them lose to people that are doing it for the wrong reasons because they don't have the reputation or they don't they're they're so they're so obscure that nobody knows who they are. So this is where like that marketing aspect comes in for me where it's like you see that all the time you see amazing business owners that have their heart in the right place but they don't know how to get their message out there they don't know how to prospect for clients properly they don't know how to position themselves as the only authority in their marketplace and meanwhile 
the business is going somewhere else to maybe another company that is, you know, doesn't have the same degree of integrity, that doesn't have the same care for the clients, you know, and, and that's where it becomes really sad, right? So business owners should really take a step back and be like, okay, my heart's in the right place, but just having my heart in the right place isn't enough. I also need to have the plan in order to execute so that I could actually have an impact on my community, myself, my family, whatever it is that we want to do. The other thing that I want to go ahead and touch on, which is going to be your second point, which is how to build relationships that matter, I think is extremely important. But before we jump into that, let's just take a quick break and think our sponsors. Hey, Dominators, real quick, let me ask you a question. How would you like to increase productivity? How would you like faster claims resolution? And more importantly, how would you like to reduce litigation? Well, this is exactly what Impartial allows you to do. Impartial creates timely, accurate estimates for faster and fair claim settlement. Building upon Matterport's technology, the Impartial Scope Tool extracts the relevant data embedded with pre-mitigation and post-mitigation scans and subsequently renders an exactimate or a similability estimate that can be approved by a carrier without any hesitation. The magic here is that the software helps contractors generate mitigation and repair estimates for more rapid approval from insurance carriers while removing the burdensome administrative process. Each impartial estimate is produced with objective accuracy using immersive 3D imagery and precise physical and geospatial measurements. Impartial, in my opinion, is one of those tools that simply can go ahead and change your business. And with so many features such as impartial tags, timestamp matter tags, the ability to upload JPEG, PNG, ESX, and so much more. Impartial is that software that could genuinely change your business. Make sure that you check them out in the video description below or in the show notes and see for yourself. Hey, Dominators, real quick, let me ask you a question. Have policyholders struggled to come up with your money because it's held with the mortgage company? Or does the percentage of uncollected debt that you collected in 2021 exceed over 2.5%? Or even better, let me ask you this. Do you dread negotiating with your policyholder when it comes time to collect your final payment and deductible? So look, if you answered yes to any of these questions, then you need to check out Surety. You see, Surety is a third-party fund control company. And what they do is they ensure that you get paid faster and more importantly, completely for the hard work that your crews are doing. Surety relieves not only the policyholder, but you of tremendous administrative burden while ensuring the claims process and more importantly, the proceeds flow via ACH to the rightful owner you the restore and here's the best part for less than the average credit card fee surety delivers on numerous fronts so here's what i want you to do if you want to learn more about how surety can help you i want you to head on over to www.surety.com forward slash dominate and request a free demo today now listen restoration domination listeners just like you are going to receive a really cool offer and here it is you're going to receive an exclusive offer which includes free processing for the first insurance claims check and three months of free access within their network again that's surety s-u-r-e-t-i dot com forward slash all right so before we left to thank our amazing sponsors, uh, we were talking about the uh, how to build relationships that matter. Expand on that. Just give us a quick, like, you know, three minute version of what it means to build relationships that matter. Well, it goes hand in hand with with uh, building reputation. The way we did it was the first people that mattered to us to build a, a good relationship with were our, our employees, because those are the right. guys who are going out there representing you. Those are your ambassadors. Mm -hmm. You, you you want to build a good reputation, build a relationship with your employee that matters. And so that's where we started. Building relationships that matter is I, when I'm out there building relationships or doing business development, it, I'm not out there trying to get a sale. I'm out there trying to find who I can really build a relationship with. Someone that no matter who comes and says something in their ear, they're not going to care because they're going to think of me no matter what. 
because they like me, because they love me, because they, they want to work with me, because they, they already know what they're going to get from me. And so I want to be genuine, right, when building relationships. I want to make sure if I'm building a relationship with a property manager, with an insurance agent, I don't do route sales. I, I have 10, 15 agents that, that I have a solid relationship with, that it's a personal relationship, that these guys call me on a weekend just to get advice for me, just to ask me a simple question. It has nothing to do with our industry or our business, but they, we've built such a great relationship that these guys are willing to reach out to me and just say, hey, how you doing? I haven't, I haven't talked to you in a while. Is everything yeah, going I just right? want to go ahead and just, yeah, those are the best types of relationships, right? The business relationships that turn into friendships, like those are, in my opinion, are the absolute best because now that you've got someone that, you know, you're, benefit, you're benefiting them, they're benefiting you. But underneath all of that, there's, there's this whole other camaraderie, right? There's this genuine friendship that, that, that occurs. I mean, if you're willing to call up somebody, uh, that you have a business relationship with just to genuinely just shoot the shit for a minute and be like, Hey, just checking in, man. How's it going? It's not like, Hey, just checking in. How's it going? By the way, do you got anything for me? Like that's different, right? Like that's, that's a totally different feel, but yeah, those are the te best types of relationships that, you know, people should be out there trying to, to forge. You know, it's, it's funny. Um, I, I always share this story and, uh, if he happens to watch it, he knows who, who it is, but, uh, my banker, he, he, you know, we, we'll talk on a Sunday. This is the VP of the bank, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Him and I will talk on a Sunday, un unrelated to business, unrelated. And we'll just, you know, we'll talk and, and we'll discuss different ideas sometimes and talk about life. And and I'm like, dude, do you realize I just called you on a Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, says, those are the best. And he says, yeah, but I have no problem with that. You can call me anytime. It doesn't matter. Right. And so those right. are the type of relationships that, that I learned to build. I don't I don't go out there just looking for volume. We 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 go out there looking for quality and because I don't want to be afraid. Look, there's so many contractors out there. There's so many other businesses and I don't want to be afraid that I'm gonna lose a relationship with someone because somebody else offered them something better. There you can't right. offer anything better than friendship. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Right. But it's got right. it has to be genuine though. That that's the key. Yeah. It has to be genuine. So when, when I say, you know, how to build relationships that matter, I'm, I'm talking about being genuine. Yeah. And now that we kind of mentioned your banker, I think that this would be like a, an amazing segue to the third point that you made, which is the financial health of, it, of any business and why it's so important. And it kind of seems like it's a very basic and elementary thing to, of course, the financials are, are, are important, but how close are we really watching the financials, right? So, so explain that to us and break that down. Why you think that this should be like the, you know, one of the top three questions that business owners should be asking themselves. I think number one is because as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, it's very easy to, to be attracted by shiny objects. It's very easy. And that's why I said, when, when we first start in business, that that's your goal in mind, right? I, I want to make a lot of money because mm -hmm. I want to buy myself some great things, right? Uh, right. We all, yep. especially us guys, right? We we want to have that boat, we want to have that motorcycle, what you name it. I have that sports car or that big truck, whatever it is that you're into, and that's your goal. And so you're thinking, oh, as soon as I get some money, I'm going to be able to afford that, right? Well, luckily we we didn't go that route. We were able to always make sure that everything in the business was taken care of, that we had a plan for actually renovating every X amount of years from three to five years, depending on, on what we're talking about, if it's equipment or if it's vehicles, we, we kind of, you know, change everything um, and make sure that, you know, we're reinvesting into the company, making sure that our employees till this day, thank God, we have never missed a payment to anyone that we owe money to. Everyone has been paid on time. We've never had to go to anyone and say, hey, can you hold off? Can you wait, you know, another week or two weeks? And that was because we, we always had that in mind. We never want to put anybody through that. This is their livelihood. You know, people come to work for you, whether it's a sub, whether it's an employee, people come to work for you and they expect to be paid. And so it's not fair to them just because you just got a big check and you you think you can now afford that nice shiny object that you're, you got your eyes on. It's not fair to everybody else. So 
the financial health of your business is very important for that reason, because then everybody is always happy to come do any kind of work for you, whether it's your employee or whether it's a subcontractor that you're using, they're going to be excited when you call them because they know they're getting paid. Number two, if you're looking to expand your business, if you're looking to bring in more salespeople, if you're looking to obtain a building and you need to go to a bank, the bank is going to look at your financial health. And that's what's going to determine whether or not they're willing to help you. It's not that the bank can't help you. They want to help you, but they have to make a decision. Is, is this company, you know, is their priority making sure that the financial health of their business is in, is in good condition? Or is this guy going to go out and, you know, buy some stuff and then not pay us back? <laughs> right? That, that's what it comes down to. And so... As a business owner, I wish more <laughs> right. uh, you know startups right. would, would really exactly. think about their financial health. And it doesn't matter where you start from. I, I just told my story. I started from scratch. I started from zero. I had no money. I don't come from money, by the way. I grew up in the rough parts of, of the city of Chicago. I, I grew up in gangs. I you know a little bit of my story that I didn't share before, but I, I don't I don't have a high school degree. I I don't have a high school diploma. I don't have a college degree. I I, I don't have formal education. And so this, this is possible. I, I, I just knew that I didn't have all this information. So I went to sources that had the information. I looked for it. I, I've never been stagnant. I've, I've always been looking for more, more information, more knowledge, more wisdom. Uh, I, I have mentors myself on top of my consultants, because I currently still have consultants, by the way. On mm -hmm. top of that, I, I still have mentors in the industry and outside of the industry that I will run things by because I don't have all the answers. And as a business owner, that's one of the keys to understand is you, you're not going to have all the answers. So you need to find people out there that are willing to share those answers with you. And that's why relationships matter. Right? <laughs> yeah, uh, 100%. And one of the biggest questions, and I mentioned this on the podcast quite a bit, and I really took a deep dive into this a couple of shows ago. And that was just asking yourself, what is it that you do not know, right? Just consistently asking yourself in the situation right here, right now, I think that this is the action that I should be taking. But what about this? Is it that I'm not aware of? And that's a, like a tough question to ask, because then you just the, the, the natural answer to that is, I don't know. Well, I don't know so what I don't know, right? Right, right. So now what we have to do is in order to find out what you're not aware of in this situation is actually, and then just came to me because it's on my desk. I just had, you know, uh, the, the gentleman from Riva on the show. And we were just talking about that. And I made like a commentary about how even something as simple as like a gym bag, I just like had no idea that it had like slots for your shoes. And like my wife brought it up to me. And I'm like, all these years I've been using a gym bag. I didn't know that this bag, <laughs> this side was for shoes. I had zero idea, right? But when you apply that to business, it constantly happens, right? And, and like you and I, we we share something very similar. I never, I never finished high school. I actually never even stepped foot in a high school. I don't know what the inside of high school looks like, but yet here we are. And the one thing that kind of carried me over was number one, just constantly asking myself, what is it that I don't know? The natural answer is usually, I don't know. So you got to get outside advice and be like, look at this. What are we, what are we doing here? And then what's the next step from there? Right? So switching gears real quick that I think is really important something that I'm really excited to talk to you about, because I want to learn more about this. We've, we've had these individuals on the show before and uh, you're, you're kind of like involved now. So talk to me about the bolt on that you've recently had onto your company with the whole plumbing side. So, you know, as, as most restorers will probably admit, you know, one, one of the, the sources that we get leads from, is plumbers, right? And right. Um, my my issue with that is, and and you know whoever does that, it, that's that's on them. Everybody runs their business the way they want to run it. But my issue with that is that over the years it, it's become abusive. There, there's too much money money going for a lead from a, coming from a plumber, 
And yeah, you got people that are paying upwards of a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks for a lead. It's like, and there's no, and they say that they have relationships. The problem is, is that there is no relationship because then if I show up and I'm like, hey, look, I'll tell you why. It's transactional. Uh, I'll pay, I'll, I'll give you $1,800 if you send me the, well, you know, they have zero loyalty. They have loyalty to wherever that money's coming in from. So I totally get that. Um, that's something that we've spoken about quite a bit, but go ahead. And that's why it's so important, right? Like I said, relationships matter. I don't want transactional relationships. And so we, for, for a couple of years, my son and I kept thinking of, how we can put a program together for plumbers that you know would refer us business and and we would work with them so we went as far as i actually build a website out there i was going to do lead generation for plumbers and then bring in a group of plumbers that we already work with and say hey i will give you leads you will refer me business and we never executed that we we just left it there we we planned on it uh, we went as far as building the website. I was at a at a business our business retreat last year with our consultants, and they they had brought in a few sponsors, and one of the sponsors was one Tom Plummer, and I met those guys, and I my son and I immediately look at each other, and he says, "Dad, did you see that?" I said, "Yes, I did. Let's go over there. Let's talk to them." So we go over there, we talk to them. And I, I was immediately sold because that was the answer to what my son and I had been trying to come up with for the past two years, basically. Um, and and mm -hmm. it was funny because we walk up to these guys and we let them do you know their spiel and, and hey, you know, give me your sales pitch, that's fine. But we're we're already sold. We want to do this. <laughs> and so right. They, they called us in for a discovery day and I said, yeah, we'll go through all the, the whole process and whatnot, you know, but I, I'm just telling you, we're ready to do this. This is what we want to do. We understand the concept, the concept behind it. This is, it'll just aligns perfectly with what we're looking to do. And after meeting these guys too, I mean, Cameron and Rocky, I, I know you've, you've had, who, who did you have on your podcast? Was it both? Okay. Okay, so uh, both, after meeting both, these both guys, Rocky, and, Rocky yeah. and I are just, we hit it off. I mean, you know, we, we went out to dinner uh, on our discovery day. We had a great time. And after that, we've been at several different events together. Uh, you know, we, we meet up at the, at the different events and we just kind of hit it off. And so it, it, was, it, was, it was a great relationship with these guys. So it was a no brainer for us. But bring, bolting that onto our restoration business now has, has been, you know, very exciting and it's been awesome because now I, I'm not worried about the plumber going somewhere else and giving the leads to somebody else. Yes. So now we have, you know, we have another source the plumber. Of, of leads coming in uh, from our plumbing company. We officially launched last month. Uh, we had a great month uh, being our first month in business, both for the plumbing company and the restoration company. So the plumbing company was able to provide some leads for the restoration company and the restoration company, because we are a full service restoration company, uh, we do GC work also, we were able to bring in our plumbing company to perform some of the repairs that needed to be done on, on the plumbing side. And so it, it was just great both ways. It, we're having an awesome time with it. And, and again, it, it was all because, you know, I was at the right place at the right time, right? If Asking the right questions and looking at it from the right from the right lens, right? So by the and by the way, I just want to go ahead and throw this in real quick. For those that may have missed the episode, check out episode number 44. It's the keys you've been looking for with one Tom Plummer. And it was an amazing episode and it kind of walks through the entire process. Uh, but it is an absolute no brainer, right? It totally makes sense. Like either a, you can go ahead and chase the plumbers and offer them money or go through whatever that sales pitch looks like, because there's a lot of people that are coaching on how to pitch plumbers, which I think is kind of comical <laughs> because really you're just offering, you know, an exuberant amount of money or, or you say, Hey, look, there's, there's other options out there. How about I built, I, I just bolt on an entire new business that goes hand in hand with what we're doing anyways. And you now, now you have this whole other revenue source, not only for 
your restoration company, but for that plumbing company as well. And the one thing that I, I enjoyed so much through the podcast and through uh, conversations with Cameron and Rocky with One Tom Plumber was the amount of detail that, you know, the, the patience that they've had in building this thing to make sure that it is successful. I, I rarely walk away from an episode and be like, wow, that was an amazing like business model. Like they really thought through it. And that was like one of the ones where I walked away from and I was like, wow, they really are onto something in the restoration. Well, and, and you know what? And so we, you know, I did my due diligence too. And I, I checked references and I, I called other business owners that had already purchased a franchise from them. And I was talking to these guys and everyone told me, you know, listen, we just like you wanted the plumbing company because we wanted additional lead, an additional lead source for the restoration. Mm -hmm. We were just thinking restoration. Well, you know, a few months into it, we realized how profitable plumbing is. And so you said it, there's another source of income now, right? Um, well, here's, here's the thing. So just to kind of expand on that, it's not how profitable, and this is where that entrepreneurial aspect that I really appreciate comes in with that particular scenario, what it comes down to one Tom plumber. It's not that they identified plumbing as a general whole and said, we are plumbers. No, they've identified how to make it the services, the services within the, the plumbing industry that are the most profitable. Correct. And they're basically telling you like, Hey, you know, Stay, these are the products and services. And, and, stay here, stay in your lane, and you'll be the most profitable. And they've just they've just got it down to a science. And Rocky and, and, and Cameron are sticklers to that. You you need to stick to the plan. And remember we talked about planning earlier and having a goal? Yep. They're the same way. You stick to the plan because this is the goal. So when you stick to the plan, that's how you, you're profitable. If you go outside of that plan then you're going to stop being profitable. And these guys found a way to make plumbing profitable in the greatest way possible. And so we got into it and we're like, oh, heck yes. Yes, we want to do this. Um, because now the, the entrepreneurial side of me, right, says, great, I get, to, I, I get to build another business now. Now I have two businesses and both of my businesses are going to be profitable. We're going to be able to create, you know, more job opportunities for people. We're, we're able to create, you know, great company culture also within our second company. And it's like, this is a no brainer because it's going to, it's also going to pay me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, again, we, we go back to why you start something initially and, and what you think your goal is and what you think, you know, is going to happen. But then you realize, no, this, this has a lot more to it. And so we, we love our relationship with those guys over at one time plumber. That's awesome. That's good. It's always nice to hear those kind of, you know, success stories. And you know, the other, the other thing that you mentioned there, which is great is you had already identified a need to, to take on more, more leads. Right. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is the marketing aspect of it. I've mentioned this a few times on previous episodes that one of the first things that an owner in any business really needs to do, but particularly in our business in the restoration arena is get really comfortable with marketing and how to generate leads. The reason for that is not only if you want to talk about building relationships, right? In my opinion, one of the one of the best ways and one of the most genuine ways to build a relationship from one entrepreneur to the next is helping the other entrepreneur. And how do you really help another entrepreneur? You say, hey, look, I can go ahead and provide you with leads. I can go ahead and, you know, get your phone ringing. I'm not going to charge you anything. I'm not going to do anything. But if you see that it's appropriate for you to go ahead and pick up the phone and shoot me a call as a recommendation for the leads that I provided you, all of a sudden, like now you've, you're building a relationship, a business relationship, first and foremost, on something that matters to both of you, right? And then, of course, through just time, eventually you guys just build this like really, really strong bond. But marketing at the core, if you know the basic skills on how to market, you can go ahead and build a website or you can go ahead and generate an amazing amazingly profitable Google ads campaign that's going to blow that person's business up. In turn, you're giving them what they want. You're not charging them for that, right? 
But every time that their phone rings, guess what? Nine, you know, let's say that five out of 10 of every call is a potential lead for you. Like, that's amazing, right? Oh, yeah. So the fact that you saw that as an opportunity and you started to execute on that, and then, of course, then you found just this whole, whole total different type of scenario, like, that's the key. Is like you're starting to identify what are the things that you can do and then what else is available out there that's going to go ahead and get you to the same spot. And, and what I was going to get to earlier, too, is, the fact that, you know, I met one Tom Plummer through uh, my consultants, right? And so mm -hmm. here we go again. Sometimes people just think of what can I what can I get out of this relationship directly? But sometimes it's the in, indirect things. I've been able to meet great business owners through my consultants, other successful business owners throughout the nation that, that we, I've been able to start building relationships with. And, and really nothing other than having conversations and getting mentorship from these guys has happened, right? But mentorship is is more valuable than an actual lead. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Because mentorship helps me go get more leads, to be more successful with how I'm running business, knowing how to run operations, you know, things that I didn't go to school for, right? So I use my mentors for that. And if it wasn't because of my consultants, I would have never met this, these people. <laughs> so 100, 100%. So again, that's why I, I find it so important uh, to understand that, that relationships really matter in business because you never know what's going to happen because of that relationship. Yes, I pay my consultants. Yes, there's a fee behind it. It's an investment, but I, I get a lot of out of it directly from them, but also indirectly. They they put me in front of, you know, some of the most successful restoration contractors in the nation. That you can't put a price on that. Uh if I were to exactly. go knock on these guys' door and say, Hey, my name is Ramiro, I want to get to meet you. They're like, Yeah, buddy, stand in line. <laughs> but I go to these events with my consultants and they find out, oh wait. They're your consultants also? Well, they're my consultants. Oh, okay. That means you're looking to do things right. That means you have an right. interest in, in in doing good business. So yeah, maybe I do want to get to know you. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and again, it's not only the tangible, but the intangibles that that are that are extremely valuable. Just getting in a room with the right kind of individuals, it's not just the information that's shared right then and there, but it's everything else that comes in afterwards that is really valuable, right? So what's next on the horizon? Uh, where Where is it that, you know, what's the next thing that you're trying to tackle as a company, as an organization? Where do you see yourself in the next uh, couple of years? So we have a, we actually, we currently are working on our five-year plan. So within the next five years, we our plan is to be in five different locations with both of our companies. Beautiful, beautiful. And then one last thing that I want to go ahead and wrap up, something that I asked the majority of our guests is top three books that you would recommend for any entrepreneur, anybody in our space to go ahead and read. Uh, do you have a top three that you like? Well, it I, I came up with a you know a, a list, um, but personally in my life, these these are the three books that have helped me. One, the one that I just finished reading is uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Mm -hmm. It's a great book. Actually, after reading that book, I there is like this energy that just awoke inside of me. My my vision just like opened up tremendously and I've been executing a lot more and been able to get more accomplished. And it was a result of that book. It, it had a great impact in my life. Um, and so I highly awesome. recommend that one to any entrepreneur. There's a book called A Purpose Driven Life uh, by Rick Warren. It, it's more of a, a faith-based book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I remember uh, here, reading that book, I think roughly I about somewhere. 15, 16 years yeah, ago. Yeah. And I was, this is when my life uh, had a shift and, and I really, you know, long story short, I, I told you part of, you know, I didn't finish high school. I, I didn't go to college, uh, grew up in rough parts, rough parts of the city, but also, you know, I, I had five kids that I was raising and it's like, it was a lot for me, and this is a transitional point in my life. And this book really helped me to determine the the man that that I'm meant to be, as a husband, as a father, 
uh, as a businessman, uh, as a man of faith. Um, this book really helped me put things into perspective. And I remember you could buy the book and then you can also buy a journal that came with it. <laughs> and even to this day, I, I go back to that journal sometimes and I read it. And I'm amazed at the things that I wrote while reading this book. And that really helps me today yeah. to, to remember the man that I'm, I'm meant to be. And so that really keeps me in line. <laughs> it, it's funny. It's funny how that works, but that, that's what happened to me. The third book I read uh, recently also uh, that I, I think for the restoration industry itself is, is very important is the that's entrepreneur awesome. conspiracy by Chuck Violent. <laughs> I read that book and I was like, okay, time to get out of my own way and time to get out of the way of my employees. Um, that, that really gave me some clarity on, on what I should be doing in my business and, and how I, I, I should be, you know, be running and, and, and holding people accountable, but also giving them, you know, good responsibility and, and giving them a good incentive to, to doing things. And, and that, that book really helped me for that. That's awesome, man. Thank you for sharing those great picks, uh, all of the, which are absolutely phenomenal. I have all of those books mentioned. So, you know, uh, if anybody wanted to go ahead and, you know, learn more about you, maybe they want to connect with you, how, what's the best way for them to go ahead and get, uh, get a hold of you? LinkedIn. I, I am a, I'm a LinkedIn addict. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's not something you hear every day. A LinkedIn addict. <laughs> a lot of my relationships are, are, held in, on LinkedIn. And uh, if you want to find me, you know, look me over Miro Martinez um, on LinkedIn and uh, you'll be able to find me right away. But yeah, that, that's, I don't do social media. The company does have its, its social media platforms that it uses, but I personally don't do social media. I, I think it's a waste of time, to be honest. <laughs> Beautiful. So LinkedIn it is. And for all those dominators out there, all of the links to the books mentioned, the previous episodes that were mentioned are going to be as well as the non- social media LinkedIn profile for Ramiro is also going to be available uh, in the video description below as well as in the show notes if you're solely listening to the podcast. Ramiro, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to uh, share your story, share your journey. Let us know, you know, you, you let us know everything from the rough beginnings to where you are now and more importantly, the great plan that you have in place. Remember, Dominators, it's all about taking the time, putting pen to paper, identifying the opportunities that you are presented with, and always keeping it real by, you know, hustling, hacking, and dominating. And I will see you guys on the next episode. Peace. Thanks, Rico. You've been listening to Restoration Domination, your number one resource for tips, tricks, and hacks to help your business grow. Subscribe to our channel and follow us for more Restoration Domination. And follow our host at Rico Garcia Jr. on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Till next time, this is Restoration Domination. Hustle, hustle, hack, hack, dominate, dominate.